All right, good morning, afternoon, and evening. It's another one on notre livre pour vous. Ah, c'est facile. All right, so this is uh, this nonviolent stuff will get you killed. How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible by Charles E. Cobb Jr. This is a nice little picture of Charles E. Cobb. Pretty recent, I think in the last 10 years-ish. Um, but yeah, so the title itself, This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, that's catchy. But really the book is How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible. How It Made It Possible. That's that's really it. Um, but very catchy, right? Um, so who's this Charles E. Cobb? I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, so he was born in 1943, okay? And so he's a little older than my mom. And in his author's note, he grounds his identity in his history. So like using his life and his ancestors' lives as markers, alongside some common historical events and dates, he lays out the framework for what Dr. Carr calls movement in memory. So if there ever, if there were ever an explanation given to the phrase, know thyself, right? This introduction, um, would serve as a good example. Okay. The entire book is great in the way that it explains people and events, many of which I was hearing about for the first time, and, and it provides a new timeline and perspective on events. So it, it quickly showed me that even in the civil rights movement, there's still a strong element of winners writing the history. I mean, people's lives and entire events were told by people with no connection to the people involved. So over and over, I can see how dangerous it is in shaping how a young person will understand and move in the world. Um, because this book basically tells a story that my post-integration schooling, my Catholic schooling, and my art school schooling, and my um, university schooling uh, did not, <laughs> okay? All right, his analyses are rooted in his experience as a student nonviolent coordinating committee SNCC field secretary from 1962 to 1967. So he was like 19 to 24 or something years old. I mean, this is a young guy in the thralls, in the throngs of it all. Like he's in it, okay? So this is first person experiences, how a story should be told. If somebody's gonna tell a story, I would rather hear from somebody on the field playing the game than somebody out in the stands who's giving me they 50 cent. They never played the game a day in their life, right? Anyway, so yeah, uh, like Bob Moses' book, um, Radical Equations, who is a contemporary at the same time, um, here's a person speaking from firsthand experience. And this book is very well researched. That's the other thing. So it's not just um, somebody who was there. This is a researcher. I mean, he goes deep. The, yeah, okay. And the um and the notes at the end are presented the same way they are in uh, Howard French's book Born in Blackness. Also, like the book I read, Brene Brown's uh, Daring Greatly, where it's just a narrative and they just read it, and then you get to the references. And I don't know why I'm. Just, <sighs> it's not a sneeze. It's something. Uh, um, you get to the end. And it just has notes by page number and it gives you a little quote and it gives you the reference and it's just a lot of references um okay the introduction let's jump in basically the book reveals how guns and armed self-defense have at all points been a part of the struggle to uproot racism even w.e.b du bois was skeptical about nonviolence in 1957 so the way that nonviolence has been praised by storytellers and, and history books about Martin Luther King Jr. and the movement in general, it is a gross misrepresentation of what was actually going on. The half has not been told. Uh, I was surprised because I expected him to talk trash about the nonviolent movement, but instead he gave credit where it was due in regards to bringing national attention, pushing legislation, galvanizing people nationwide, etc. More than one thing can be true, and he provides context for both. So it's not like Martin versus Malcolm, you know. No, this this is very uh, comprehensive to just look at the whole landscape, right? Okay, most of the black belt in Alabama, where I'm from, 
not about that nonviolent life. No, period. Some will use the Old Testament to like support nonviolence. So you got like the Nat Turner revolt sort of, this is what we got to do against the enemies. And, and then you also have what I would grew up in, you know, you have the New Testament, the New Testament to promote this peace. Hey, hey, guys, whoa, whoa, take it easy. Jesus wouldn't, <laughs> you know. So MLK Jr., uh, here's, a, here's a nice anecdote. He had, he had hella anecdotes. I'm only going to hit on just facts that just stuck out, right? Because this book is so worth reading. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., he applied at the sheriff's office for a permit to carry in Montgomery. So that's down the street from Birmingham, right? Down the street, a little a little up the street from Auburn and, and Tuskegee. Okay. Um, he was denied. But still, he had firearms at his house. Now that right there, that puts another lens on the idea of gun control and guns in general, right? Oh, yeah. He uh, breaks down when gun control first entered the picture. I'm talking about the colonies, the, these British colonies, right? So, yes, it starts in slavery. So, let's jump into chapter one. He uh, In 1680, the Virginia General Assembly codified that it was illegal for any black person to carry any type of weapon or potential weapon. Anyone caught was to be lashed 20 times. So, first gun control laws, that's important. It wasn't against white people, <laughs> right? But also, Dred Scott in 1857. Um, so, you have Chief Justice Roger Taney, who rules against blacks being given constitutional rights because it would give to persons of the Negro race the full liberty of speech in public and in private upon all subjects, the right to hold public meetings upon political affairs and to keep and carry gun arms wherever they went, endangering the peace and safety of the state. Okay? So that just race is made up, but we live in the consequences of the institutions. And it's just that's why history is important. You don't have to think you even identify with a certain race to still be in it. To still, <laughs> it's still a part of every. Okay, the state's got a long history of uh, coming for our guns when it comes to black people, which is a part of the whitewashing history that holds up nonviolence with no acknowledgement of the necessity for armed defense against continuous acts of hatred from the law to lynching to the KKA and everyone else. Okay. He hits on how the government has a history of skewing events in history via things like the birth of the nation, you know, with Woodrow Wilson and Gone with the Wind, where white terrorist groups are celebrated, straight up celebrated. Reconstruction portrays blacks as corrupt and incompetent. So Cobb, Charles Cobb, like Howard French, brings in new names and events all around this time period of reconstructions. You know, Howard French, he, he started all the way with Spain and Portugal into Africa. But uh, here, um, Cobb is like just, he's hidden all along the South, but it's all about the time period. Okay, let me just keep going. See, I started deviating. <laughs> December 17, 1867, New York Times reported an incendiary Negro, George Shorter, who was calling uh, who was calling for blacks in Bullock County. Now, this is where my grandma, granddad, this is where my folks from, Bullock County, right? Um, he was calling on them to organize a separate black government, and he was arrested. This is in 1867, so this is four years after, um, well, really two in Alabama uh, after emancipation. This is uh, like my great grandmother's time. So Kasula is is still still down there. You know, he, he's down in Mobile. So just give me some, this is, uh, yeah, man. And this is right after emancipation. So this is like, they're still fighting a civil war. And he talks about this, how in Louisiana, reconstruction was really a continuation of the civil war. Uh, so this, this is kind of what you're hearing here. Like some New York Times is reporting about this incendiary Negro. <laughs> He's like, hey, this freedom thing is not working. They're not going to abide. We need to form a separate government. He's arrested. Okay. 
this is when it gets good or better. <laughs> Black veterans returning home were considered dangerous and disarming them was a priority. Laws were passed and the houses were raided for illegal guns, arguing that they were not, uh, uh, arguing, arguing that they were not infringing on their Second Amendment rights. So the raids, the cops and all that, all the authorities were saying, no, 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 this isn't about your Second Amendment rights. And here's where my whole thing comes up with like, um, Eli Mistyle's book. Like, I just don't, I can't get into arguments with these people about these laws because at no point did they just, oh, that's what it says, that's what we're gonna do. No, they were always twisting it for their end. So here you got the Second Amendment, like, oh no, that doesn't apply to what we're doing to you black people. <laughs> I mean, okay. With all their white terrorism, arming themselves was self-defense, a deterrent. And even then, it was risky to show force when the entire structure of society was against black empowerment. Um, Du Bois said that Reconstruction in Louisiana was just a continuation of the Civil War, which just sums it all up during that period. Cobb details two great examples of black resistance in Colfax and New Orleans, Louisiana in 1873 and Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1874. Um, you had veterans and formerly enslaved people armed to defend themselves against white terrorism 90 years before the civil rights movement and it never stops so when he's starting to talk about all these different revolts he also talks about revolts that were in the north um he's just showing how this armed defense is as old as the institution it's never stopped but you aren't it just without him saying it it's like you aren't learning about resistance you aren't learning about revolt in school you aren't learning about how the struggle was fought and won in many cases for blacks you're only learning about this pacifist way this was the good way so this is the way you need to know about <laughs> you know i mean that's what it feels like right okay um chapter two and the same thing with american history in general howard zinn's people's history of the united states an entire history that chronologically expounds on all of the protests, revolts, upheavals, unionizing, everything that happened all the way to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So, well, starting with the indigenous people and through slavery and then all people in the states, not just the black, not just indigenous, not just the women, uh, not just minority. I mean, the gamut shows how there's always been a struggle going on, which is who's going to report it. Okay, chapter two. Um, he has some really good anecdotes in this chapter. Uh, well, every chapter. Um, I won't spoil all that goodness for those who are about to read the book. Um, but some good facts, though. In the presidential election of 1936, right, that's when the black voters left the Republican Party in large numbers to vote for Democrat Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So this is like in the Jim Crow era, right, I believe. So giving context to when that party switch happened because I'm still starting to cement that. I've read a couple of books that have alluded to it and here's just one more, okay. Cop goes into, uh, Cobb goes into the ways uh, white raising terrorism increased after the war. Again, a response to blacks, especially veterans, being unwilling to accept white domination and injustice toward their communities. So it, it, it's that, that white lash, they call it, that white backlash that always comes from we won't stand for this oh well we're gonna make it that much harder you know we we don't, we're not gonna you know okay uh you got some atlanta riots in 1906 and this is where wb the boys uh he, he's working at atlanta university and uh he's he has a shotgun sitting on the porch to protect his wife and daughter uh, uh, dr carr talks about that story a lot um or he's mentioned it a few times and now i'm actually reading it for the first time right um and you got uh, black troops in a confrontation with whites in Houston, Texas in 1917. That was a crazy story. That's wow. Okay. And again, defending themselves against mistreatment. This isn't an offensive game that they're playing over and over again. This is just defense, right? And, and many of the white races considered them tainted, uh, speaking about the black veterans, by their overseas military service 
I mean, once you see what life can be outside of these states, you're forever changed. And that happened to me when I left Alabama. Um, every time I've traveled, you know, it's like a parachute. What do you say? It only functions when open. In a way, your mind expands, right? And um, there is no uh, undoing that. Once you've seen it, there's just no way back. Uh, okay. In chapter three, he mentions uh, Medgar Evers and his brother. He also mentions Amzy Moore. So I finally just went ahead and got a picture of this guy because uh, um, I hear so much about him. Uh, he's been in, in a lot of the books that I read. Uh, speaking about everything that was going on in Mississippi and the uh, freedom movement there. Uh, so obviously he was a vet, you know what I'm saying? But I'm not getting into his history. I just want to show you a picture of him because he's a cool dude. He kind of looked like my uncle uh, the, the past. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, he also talks about Fannie Lou Hamer and her mother, who also had a gun, uh, who, who was also a gun owner. Um, veteran Aaron Henry, who became president of the Mississippi NAACP in 1960, and uh, Walter White also. So really great stories about these historical titans in the movement. Um, okay, here's a great, a great anecdote. Got a lot of good ones like this. Here we go. Jackie Robinson, 1944. He refused to move to the back of an army bus at a training camp at Fort Hood, Texas. He was arrested by the MP and court martial court martial for insubordination now this kind of stuff happens all the time basically if they don't like you they'll get you for article uh i mean in the ucmj man i don't even want to remember the articles now but there are particular articles that are so general that if they don't like you they're going to get you with that they're going to get you for that article uh and, and it happens all the time and the accountability outside of the military is like it's just hard. It's just hard to bring note notice to any kind of infractions that go on because even if you did, you have people transferring out so far. So even if something is consistent, it gets somewhat washed clean over like two years because that person transfers out, you transfer out. So suddenly they can be a problem all over again for a very short period and then get moved somewhere else and keep getting promoted because they don't have a track record at one place. They keep moving around being a disturbance, being you know, whatever it is. <sighs> Sorry. Okay, back to this. Um, okay, so he was he so Jackie Robinson, he's arrested, court martial, insubordination, acquitted, transferred, and honorably discharged four months later. Now Jackie Robinson is like one of the most outspoken, like Pan African. I don't wanna give him labels necessarily, but I mean he is so about his blackness and fighting for his race. Historically he does that, and the narrative has been twisted. Um just to have has not been told about him. So this just completely speaks to his character. He's like, no, you're not. We're supposed to be integrating here and you're fighting that integration, trying to make me go sit at the back. And, uh, <laughs> and he's a resident of subordination. He's not one of those get along. Why don't you just do it? Everybody's doing it. Why don't you just do it, Jackie? Why you gotta be so difficult? No, cause I'm, I'm a man. I don't care what you see me as, I'm a man. <laughs> and this is not how you treat a man. This is not how you treat you. This is how you treat Okay. <clears throat> anyway, over 50 years ago when, uh, I mean, this, this stuff was going on, uh, like Charlie Cobb, he, he points out something that I'm just now discovering, right? Cobb talks about uh, the political rhetoric that um, starts to mute white supremacist common speech and begins incorporating phrases like states' rights and protecting our American way of life. All of these things being code for what is really continuing oppression laws and societal dynamics that were presently at that time destructive to blacks and supported by the KKK and other supremacist groups, right? Saw the same thing in the lost education of Horace Tate uh, with the teacher organizations. So when it came to funding coming from the state level, they would incorporate things that encouraged the segregation and also would favor uh, white teachers, white schools, and deplete the black schools. And, and, and he just breaks down. Oh, and that was in uh, 
Negro Education in Alabama, Horace Mann Bond. So you see how the language gets muted, but the effects remain constant. So when you hear the outcry from the uh, from the black communities, they're just calling it out. But it's been muted so much among the white population, they don't even <laughs> they don't have to acknowledge it anymore. <laughs> it's 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 crazy. Okay, um, so that was cool. For them, protesting the federal government was mainly to fight integration as it was meant to be implemented, which is uh, basically what I was just saying, right? So when they, yeah, uh, here's another funny one. I had to look this up because I love acapella groups. I was going to play the link on here, but I don't know the, I don't care to play this stuff on my videos, but there's a group called the Confederates who won the 1956 Barbershop Harmony Society's International Quartet Champion with the song Save Your Confederate Money Boys The South Shall Rise Again so I looked up this group because I've sang in a few groups I've sang in smock fellow groups I love that stuff I'm like let me hear what their four part harmony sounds like let's see if they got a soprano alto tenor bass let's see if they're um, messing with some uh, some seconds or some sevens on there let's let's see if they know some four part without the bass let's see what kind of harmonies is it just three part you know major and minor chords like what are they really trying to do with that transition are they are they all following the same melodic line at the same time or are they kind of branching off and doing like three different things let's, let's, let's see what they about right <laughs> so I listened to it oh man and I was just like these people don't think they're racist but neither does the little drummer boys that got to play for the Nazi soldiers as they walked down the street they're guilty by association and we should accept that first before we start pointing the fingers at somebody else just being American makes me guilty by association to some atrocity and I get that multiple conflicting things can be true at once now in regards to that quartet they were garbage they were garbage not only was the song garbage because of its racist origins but they just really weren't good like the the mics weren't that good I, I, mm, no there wasn't no take six it wasn't no boys to me I'm just saying okay anyway um Cobb gives examples of how Klansmen fled because they saw a show of strength from armed veterans in 1947. And um, see, also he talks about the formation of the Monroe NAACP in North Carolina, or the Monroe Rifle Club, also called the Black Guard, in many ways due to the work of the World War II vet, Dr. Alvin Perry. So, uh, and even in 1959, the NAACP passed a resolution affirming the right of self-defense. Uh, so for me, that was like, there's a part where you see how the armed defense and resistance has worked, right? But it's all about what works in a certain period. So he goes into that. In uh, chapter four, um, I learned a, a lot more about the doctor that Mammy Till Mobley, Emmett Till's mom, the doctor that helped her and she writes about him in her book, uh, Dr. T.R.M. Howard. Uh, he was he was like a professional. Um, he was in the professional class back then. Uh, he, he founded the Regional Council of Negro Leadership in 1951. Um, and that group started a gas station boycott. Don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom. They saw a political influence leveraging their economic influence that was great and this is 70 years ago by the way <laughs> okay the citizens council which was a new tool for white supremacy was born in indian o indianola mississippi in 1954 no surprise there um regarding attacks from groups like that the decision quote the decision of what to do centered not on the choice between nonviolence and violence but on the question of what response was best in each situation. And this theme comes back throughout the text. It's about what response was best in each situation. That's all. And you could think the same thing with Martin and Malcolm, right? Like what, depending on who you're with, what the environment calls for, you might need a Malcolm to speak to these people and not a Martin. You know, I mean, anyway. 
Um, quote, what was always at play was the common sense of survival and flight when necessary was not cowardice. Just the shooting hopelessly in the name of manhood was not always courage. Okay. All right. So in chapter five, he talks about James Farmer and the Congress of Racial Equality or CORE in 1942, its affiliation with the uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation for uh, SNCC and SELC and all of their proximities to nonviolence and armed self-defense because at all points they coexisted um and all the discussions are great i mean there's just too much to sum up here chuck uh McDo of snick said quote speaking against nonviolence is like speaking against your mother it's god and apple pie how could you disagree with the ideal but if some redneck cracker tries to shoot me i'm justified trying to defend myself if i can I'm not going to let him kill me, end quote. And for sure, there were talks of violent offensives, right? But going back to doing what's best in particular situations, the idea of being offensive was dismissed early. I mean, they would just joke. You're going to be out, man, out gun. The federal government is not going to support you. Um, and they've shown that, right? So you don't want to cost more life than it's worth when you don't have basically the military behind you, right? This is just not a good idea. And you're doing it to the thing yourself. You're not even doing it to take nothing. You just, just like leave me up. Oh, it's, it's incredible. Okay, Julian Bond, son of Horace Mann Bond, who I was speaking about, enrolled in a social philosophy class in 1962 at Morehouse College, taught by Martin Luther King Jr. That was cool. Um, I really love how Cobb talks about all the students involved in the sit-ins being the best and the brightest on their college campuses. Uh, and he kind of puts them in a category like W.E.B. Du Bois has now known it, but here was his talented 10th right here. Here's his talented 10th coming down out of these schools and being a part of this, this movement. Um, so he runs down the list of leaders and their positions and student governments, academic achievements, etc. He, so he talks about like Stokely Carmichael. Oh, I actually saw a picture with uh, Charles Cobb Jr. with Stokely Carmichael too. I just didn't download that, but he got some great interviews to check out about this book too. I started watching them and I was like, ah, I'll just talk about it. And let's see. Um, John Wheeler, Annette Jones White, Charles Jones, Marion Wright, and a lot of others. And some of these were children of World War II vets. And so he talks about how that carries the spirit of resistance and empowerment um, through their elders and to them and to their movement. So it's so as rarely is there like a first generation person speaking out, blah, blah, blah. They usually come from a long line of people challenging, pushing for freedoms, pushing for authorities. Um, yeah. Uh, in chapter six, it's the last chapter, um, finally brings in the deacons of defense. That was the first group I heard about beyond the Black Panthers, but uh, Deacons of Defense in Bogalusa, Louisiana, and then you got the Black Panthers in Lowndes County, Alabama. Now, it's clear at this point that these weren't the pioneers. Uh, it was all those that existed after emancipation that he has already run down the list in the in the previous chapters. Those were the forerunners. So you've had armed defense all the way up into this. So the idea that the Black Panthers just like came out of nowhere. No, this stuff was going on everywhere, everywhere. You know, some just rose up more than the others. Same way that you hear about companies and how all these companies shoot up. But um, so many similar companies die off and you really don't know which, which one is going to um, maintain that momentum and actually break out. Anyway such as Black Panthers, you could say. Um, there was also the Tuscaloosa Citizens for Action Committee, TCAC, and Malisham's group in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Let's go. These groups all started as necessary to defend themselves against racism in the South. I had no idea how common it was in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and Louisiana. So, these stories just show how active rather than passive all my ancestors have really been. Um, a complete 180 from the stories I heard growing up, right? 
What's important to note, however, is their activism and organization around self-defense only fueled further white supremacist violence. So this was always an unintended consequence of standing up for yourself. And this nation's history is one of continued aggression, both domestically and abroad. Without provocation, you're just going to keep... Uh, yeah, and, and again, this is just another side of the story. So the epilogue, uh, he goes deep into the voting rights efforts in Mississippi and Alabama and how these armed defense groups were intricate in these movements. Uh, he sums up he sums up my education in black history with these words, quote, Central to much of this mainstream narrative is that the moral splendor of long-suffering blacks persuaded the nation's leaders to sympathize with civil rights legislation. And you can close the book on the black history section. <laughs> That's, yeah. And uh, like Bob Moses speaks about in Radical Equations, this is a bottom-up history showing all the different grassroots movements, individuals, um, events that help shape the major events in the freedom movement. Um, and this book teaches how armed self-defense was a huge part of that. So with that, uh, I really, really enjoyed this book. I really appreciated all the scholarship. Um, and uh, next I'm going to be, oh Lord, I'm, I'm going to say it out loud because that means we're going to have to do it. But I'm going to go ahead and read Black Reconstruction. WB Du Bois just to just be able to say I did it alright keep reading uh, until next time à la prochaine uh, beaucoup l'amour much love alright later